In 2020, I spoke with a neurosurgeon who suspected that I might have craniocervical complications linked to EDS. He recommended a spinal fusion as treatment and advised us to get a halo vest surgically placed for three months to get an idea of how successful a spinal fusion could be for me. He also wanted to get more specialized scans to get a better understanding of my condition. So, in 2021, we traveled to the country's only upright weight-bearing MRI facility to get scans on my brain and spine, to see the neurosurgeon in person, and to discuss my treatment options. We also spoke to a neurosurgeon in Spain to get a second opinion. He said, don't let anyone ever tell you that a spinal fusion will fix you. We have just arrived at the hospital and we're about to go in and see the neurosurgeon. We didn't get a disability pup, but we did get a nice view. Samina and I went into the hospital where we had the appointment with the neurosurgeon. He looked at my scans, did the measurements, as well as a physical assessment. I will tell you about how this appointment went, as well as a second opinion that we got from a neurosurgeon in Spain at the end of this video, as after this appointment, we decided to take a break from the medical and go exploring, and I want to show you that footage first. <laughs> you want to do the rest? I got coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we're home now. I'll update you later. Well, back to where anyway. we're staying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put the footage through here. I just love the feeling of driving through, well, not me driving, but me passengering through when the trees are like hanging over the, um, the road. It's just something so amazing when driving through like rows of trees. It's just incredible. So I'll put that footage through in here. Just have an afternoon just to have fun and chill and not really think about medical stuff. So I, um, realized a couple of days ago when I looked at the date for one of my appointments when I was filling out the form I was like oh my birthday is really soon it must be like next week and it is next week it's Thursday today it's in like a few days really and um, I'd like forgotten all about my birthday just because of all the medical stuff that's happening so if I'm feeling up for it we're going to go to like Taronga Zoo in Sydney or the aquarium near the harbour bridge uh, they're kind of famous places and I've been wanting to do something with animals for a really long time I've been kind of craving it because I just love animals so much so hopefully we'll be able to do that next week good morning it is a beautiful winter morning this morning here in Australia so I thought I'd take you guys all out here and film this future mail part of all about my neurosurgery appointment so it was actually a year and a half ago 2021 was a crazy year that I just a lot of my filming and editing got put on the back burner and um, and it has actually been two years since 
my doctor first mentioned and suggested neurosurgery um, and for me to get a spinal fusion so I'll put that video below if you want to see it um, but this will have more updated information so first I'll tell you about what my diagnoses are and what my scans showed so that if you're here for that video for that information I'm not wasting your time and then I'll kind of tell you about my experience. I ended up seeing a, talking to a neurosurgeon in Spain about six months after talking to the doctor here in Australia. There's really only one neurosurgeon here in Australia who is familiar with EDS and um, craniocervical instability and who's really got that um, knowledge and training to properly measure the scans to make diagnosis and all that sort of thing. Um, so I'll tell you my experience with the different doctors, why I saw another doctor, just their different recommendations as to treatments, and um, yeah, good girl Amaya, good girl, Amaya's laying on the floor next to me, she's wondering who I'm talking to, she thinks I'm crazy. Um, so firstly the scans showed the upright MRIs, they looked at the upright MRIs, and they also looked at the supine um, CT scans that I did in flexion, extension, and rotation. In the upright MRIs, they did the measurements to measure for craniocervical instability. And I will post, I will link a video in the description from my friend Rachel Elizabeth. She has a really, really good video about what these different measurements are to test for craniocervical instability. And unfortunately, your general neurosurgeon will not um, do these measurements to look for craniocervical instability. And also at the radiology clinic, when you get your report back, they will have most likely also not done those measurements to look for craniocervical instability. So sometimes your report can come back saying it's normal, but you actually need a trained neurosurgeon who understands how to do these um, measurements to actually be able to properly rule out craniocervical instability. So um, from talking to both these neurosurgeons they diagnosed me with craniocervical instability which is CCI for short um, and in the upright MRIs they could also see that I had instability from C1 to C6 so in each of those vertebrae and they weren't sure from below there because the scans didn't show that um, but in each of those vertebrae I had um, instability and I also had herniations of the discs between those vertebrae in multiple discs were herniated in those MRIs. Um, they could also see that the brain stem and the spinal cord were both compressed but they could not see exactly how much they were compressed because the scan was fuzzy because I wasn't able to um, hold in the position that I was supposed to long enough and I will also link below my experience with the upright MRIs so that you if you want to know a bit more about what I'm talking about there you can have a look at that um, so um, yeah they <laughs> they could see there was a fair bit going on and then they also looked at the supine C scan C, C scan C scan, CT scan that I did with in um, flexion, extension, and rotation. So that's looking up, looking down, looking left and right, but all laying on my back. Um, so that was not an upright, and I actually did that a couple of years ago. Um, but as I said before, my report um, from the radiology clinic came back um, clear, but I actually needed a neurosurgeon who was properly trained. And when they looked at this. Um, when they looked at this CT scan, they could very clearly see a lantoaxial instability as well, so AII. And to be honest, when I look at that scan, I can see it, and I'm a layman. Um, and before I even went to these appointments, I was like, I think I could have a lantoaxial instability, but I don't want to self-diagnose just from looking at my scans. So when you turn your head left and right, your vertebrae generally, you know, move like this. 
but what's happening when I'm looking left and right is my vertebrae is slipping and moving so my I don't know if that's a very good representation of why I'm doing it right but it kind of gives you an idea so my vertebrae are actually slipping off each other and my neck is actually subluxing when I look left and right um, so that's kind of not ideal um, but it explains a lot of my symptoms I was also examined by the neurosurgeon in Australia and he was able to determine that I had SI joint dysfunction, so that's dysfunction in the hip joints, and he also suspects tethered cord syndrome. Both neurosurgeons also said that they could not rule out um, intracranial hypertension because my symptoms uh, align with it and they could not rule out tethered cord syndrome. The neurosurgeon in Spain sent me for a prone um, C no MRI. Um, I just haven't done it yet because I've wanted a break from all the things. Um, and I didn't think it was urgent because if it shows up with tethered cord, I'm not about to go into surgery anyway. So I will explain now the difference between my two appointments. I need a breather. <sighs> In my appointment with the neurosurgeon in Sydney, so the earlier part of this vlog is that appointment, um, he, he's good, I respect him, he was very kind, um, but there are quite a few limitations with him and as I said, this, he's really the only option in Australia as far as a neurosurgeon who understands EDS and craniocervical instability. His reception staff are very good, they're very kind, they're very helpful, they're very good at their job, they do what needs to be done and they're also very knowledgeable about these conditions and he is also very good. I would recommend him but as I said there are some limitations and I will mention some of those limitations on film. So he has, at the point that I had been seeing him, um, he so he, re he recommended a spinal fusion for me in my first appointment with him and then about six months later is when I saw him in person. So that's this appointment that I'm talking about. And at that point in time he told me that he's only been doing these measurements and working with people with CCI um, as a complication of EDS for 18 months. So he's only been doing, hi puppy, so he's only been doing these measurements that long. Um, and he's also only done three spinal fusions. He did not tell me the outcome of those spinal fusions, but I know from my physio who works with those some of those patients that um, one of those spinal fusions didn't work out so great. So his protocol is to first put a halo vest on you for 12 weeks. So that's where they drill into your skull with... Um, screws and they screw it into your skull and it's like a thing that goes around here and then it's got the things and it's got the vest around and his point for doing that is that it will see whether you're a good candidate for a fusion um so if that helps your symptoms it will indicate that a fusion could help your symptoms um but i do know that this one particular patient um she had a good result with the the, the halo vest but not so good with the fusion and I don't know about the other two um, so we actually went to Sydney um, with the knowledge that I might have to get a spinal uh, a halo vest um, but we just have to see how severe my brainstem compression was in the scans if my brainstem compression was really severe then I would kind of have to get it because it would be dangerous for me not to. We couldn't exactly see how severe it was, but we decided not to go through with that procedure, even though the neurosurgeon was recommending for me to get the halo vest while I was in Sydney at that point in time. I'm really glad that I didn't because I had my feeding tube surgery very shortly after that. And as you guys know, I had a lot of trouble with infection. I'm really glad I didn't have a halo vest that was drilled into my brain or into my skull that could have that I could have got infected from and had infection in my brain like it could have led to that so um, I just didn't want to take that complication and 
I just didn't want something screwed into my head because I was still thinking, well, I want to avoid a spinal fusion as long as I possibly can. I want to look into alternative options. Um, so I don't want to do a halo vest right now. And the other thing in my appointment with him was he kept telling me a spinal fusion will fix you. And he kept telling me, we'll get you fixed. We'll do a spinal fusion and it'll get you fixed. And all these troubles you're having will go away. You won't have troubles with food anymore. You won't have pots anymore. You won't have pain. You'll get your life back. You will be healthy. Um, it will fix you. And that gave me a really bad feeling. Because I felt like it was almost unethical. That he could, re he could promise me that this would fix me. When... He's only done three of them and he's only been doing this for 18 months. I just did not feel right about that. And also the the literature and the 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 patient experiences and the studies out there show that you can't promise that. It just you just can't promise that. He also wanted to fuse me all the way from my skull to T5. So that's kind of like a bit below where your shoulder blades would be and that's just a huge fusion um and so his uh, his idea for doing that was because i have got instability quite far down but also he said that would avoid the problem that you get with eds and i will link a video below of that i will actually be after this video of um me talking about considering different treatment options and I'll talk about this complication a bit more in that video but with EDS what can happen is everything underneath your fusion can then become unstable and um, what has happened with patients before like Christina Doherty has um, described her experience online I will link that below um, she has a full fusion from her skull to her hips um, that's just happened over time because everything under her fusion has become unstable. Um, so he thought his idea for fusing that much would be that it would prevent that from happening. But in my eyes, that's still going to happen because you've still got the rest of your spine. And in my eyes, I feel like that's going to happen even more because all of that area underneath is taking all of the weight of all that fused area. Um, so... It wasn't great. The other thing was a lot of our questions we were asking him, he was saying that he didn't know. Um, and that's completely fine. I actually appreciate when doctors say that they don't know rather than just making something up or telling you it's all in your head. I much prefer them having the humility to say that they don't know because you would be surprised the amount of doctors who don't have the humility to say I don't know and the damage that that does is incredible and I'm not trying to be rude or disrespectful to those doctors but raising awareness about them is doctors need to be able to say I don't know so we appreciated that but we needed answers still so that's one of the reasons why we ended up seeing the uh talking to the neurosurgeon in Spain and I also asked him about prolotherapy and regenerative medicine what he thought what's his what his thoughts were on that and he said you're joking um so he didn't think anything of it he said i could do it in my si joints so that's kind of the joints in the hips but not in the neck he said he had a few patients who'd gotten septic shock from it and almost died so that's valid um he said that the risks for the prolotherapy were more than the risks of neurosurgeon which neurosurgery which i personally don't agree with um, I mean, I respect him for saying it, but I personally don't agree with it. If you're a little off balance, it's just because you're sitting in a plant pot. So both neurosurgeons also said that to diagnose intracranial hypertension, which is high pressure around the brain, where the pressure in the brain is too high. It's also called pseudotumor cerebrae, which means it's like a tumor. All the symptoms are the same. 
as a tumor but it's not a tumor instead it's pressure around the brain so it's still a tight space that there's too much pressure in and that can cause a lot of headaches basically can make you feel like your brains are gonna explode and it can cause a lot of other symptoms both neurosurgeons said to be able to diagnose that I would need a spinal tab where you puncture your dura and um, measure the um, measure the pressure I believe of your uh, c cerebral spinal fluid both neurosurgeons agreed that that's not a good idea for me at the moment and that the risks especially for an EDS patient are high you know of developing um, cerebrospinal fluid leaks um, you can get them from the procedure but then there's also some EDS patients who go on to have them intermittently this is when your spinal fluid gets too low and there's also just other symptoms so they said to um, keep it on the back burner and especially the neurosurgeon in Australia said to keep it on the back burner um, because again I'm not going to be getting neurosurgery at the moment there's other things that I want to try that I'll talk about in my next video before neurosurgery so it doesn't matter to me that much of a diagnosis at this point in time so when I talked to the um, neurosurgeon in Spain it was such a good experience and I've talked to people about my experience like some of my friends from the US and they said that that experience was even better than their experience with some of the top neuros neurosurgeons in the US um, one of the things that I really appreciated about him is he said to me don't let anyone ever tell you that a spinal fusion will fix you I want to say that again he said don't let anyone ever tell you that a spinal fusion will fix you and this is exactly what I was feeling in my gut about uh, what this doctor in Australia had said and I just felt like he couldn't tell me that um, this neurosurgeon in Spain said you know the reality of it is that you could get 80% better but you could also get 2% better or 0% better or worse and that's the reality of it he said this neurosurgeon in Spain from memory he's been doing it for over 25 years he has a lot of knowledge about EDS a lot of knowledge about craniocervical instability I've talked to people who've had very successful spinal fusions with him and um yeah so he is very good he's one of the best in the world and so he was saying that there is no way to predict or guarantee the outcome of a spinal fusion so he said the it's a bit of a gamble so the reality is i could get 80 percent better i could get worse and that's the reality of it and that that's horrible <laughs> like that's a hard thing to go into um and the people that I know of who have had spinal fusions with him have had them because they are in danger if they don't have them and you know they're at risk of death or risk of paralysis etc um, and he said there's certain things he wouldn't be able to tell me about his sort of estimate of how how far down we would have to fuse and that sort of thing unless he was able to see me in person um, but yeah, my appointment with him was just so great and I'm um, trying to remember all the good points. I might pop on here again later to tell you them, but that was the main thing. And um, I also asked him about the regenerative medicine and prolotherapy, which I'm looking into, MPRP injections. And he didn't scoff at me. He said, go for it. Um, he said, if I have the resources to do it, then he said, it's a less invasive option and if I want to try it first and I have the resources to then he would say go for it and um, that it is a much less invasive option than a spinal fusion and so if I want to if I have the resources to then he would say go ahead trying that before a spinal fusion and I really appreciated that because that was kind of what I was looking for um, so yes um so he also said to make sure i'm wearing a neck brace when i am in the car or anything like that because if we 
stop suddenly and I have a bit of whiplash, you know, that can be extremely detrimental to someone with EDS and CCI. And a very small accident could have really, really, really severe outcomes for me. Um, so just things like that. Um, so overall, that was my experience. That's the outcome. That's the diagnosis. That's my thoughts. In my next video, I will talk about um, more of my decision making process of considering a halo vest, a spinal fusion and regenerative medicine um, and why I haven't, why it's been two years since I was recommended a spinal fusion and I haven't yet got one. And yeah and so I will kind of explain that more in my next one and I am actually going to be seeing a regenerative medicine doctor so I actually have an appointment with a regenerative medicine doctor here in Australia in a few weeks time and the timing and the circumstances around that are really really incredible and God's provision. He's just come back from getting some training in some clinics in America that I was considering going to. So I'll tell you all about that in the vlog of going there. This video is getting long and I am reaching my capacity so I'm going to end it here and if there was a few more positive points about that neurosurgeon in Spain I will just pop them on the screen here and I will see you guys in the next one. I really hope that this next week for you is as good as it can possibly be that you have the lowest symptoms as possible and that it's just a really great week for you and um, if you are if you're going through this process of diagnostics and seeing neurosurgeons I really want to wish you well and wish you good luck and I also just want to take a moment here to um, raise awareness that seeing these neurosurgeons is very very expensive we had family members who paid for us to see them um, because they're private and especially when it's going to be international it's very expensive and um, yeah so there's really no one in the public system these doctors are not accessible for everyone and if you're in that situation where you're having trouble accessing these doctors I'm really really sorry and I really wish there was something I could do about it I really wish that I could pay for you but I can't and I just hope that um, me being here on the internet will help raise awareness for that in the future Okay, so I'm going to say goodbye now. Bye.